Hello everyone, welcome everybody to the uh, USR 21, 2021 Shiny session. Uh, I'm your host for this session, so I will just create uh, some few words about myself. Uh, my full name is Mohamed Fadili Adadan. I'm a data scientist at a company called SSW Trading, and we do a lot of Shiny and uh, web application development with R, so I'm very excited with this session. Uh, I will be helped with two, uh, two great uh, co-hosts, so Chibuokum um, Ben Uba and Juan Pablo Narvaez Gomez. So a big thanks to both of you. Um, so just to remind you, there is a, a code of conduct for this session and for the conference as overall. So too long, don't read, just be kind to each other and respectful and everything will be fine. Um, also, I will just give a few thanks to our sponsor of today. So a uh, uh, huge thanks to uh, Absilon and Open Analytics for sponsoring this uh, session. So uh, as you see, we have four presentations. Um, we will start with uh, the first one. So we have like a group of researchers from Germany, from Furtwagen University in Germany, namely Veronika Schari, Philipp Pascali, and Matthias Kohl. They will talk about uh, um, a smartphone-based system uh, in which um, they've used this smartphone-based system to detect early uh, diseases. And they relied heavily on Shiny application and Shiny mobile. Uh, it's really, it's a, a really interesting. TikTok, so I'm excited for it. Um, so let's uh, discover it. So I will ask Ben if you can share the first presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Veronika Shari, and today I will present with my colleague Philip Pascali the all in one smartphone based system for quantitative analysis of point of care diagnostics. First, we want to introduce the research groups which cooperated with us. And um, two groups come from the Institute of Precision Medicine, which is based at the Hochschule Furtwang University, which is in the Black Forest in Germany. Our group is the Data Science for Life Science group, and it consists of Professor Matthias Kohl, myself, Veronika Schari, and Philipp Pascali. And we do we do data science and bioinformatics for the most part. We get our data from the Deigner Lab, which includes Professor Hans-Peter Deigner, Simone Rentschler, and Christoph Rupert for these experiments they performed for this project. And they did the development of the point of care diagnostics and the experimental work. Another group which cooperated with us was from the Institute of Hygiene, Microbiology and Environmental Medicine from the Medical University of Graz, Austria. There we cooperated with Professor Ivo Steinmetz and Dr. Gabriel Wagner-Lichtenegger. And they also provided us with point of care diagnostics and did experimental work. So what are point of care diagnostics or POC devices? POC tests are performed at the site of patient care, for example, at the bedside. That's why they're called point of care diagnostics. And they offer a very straightforward result, so either positive or negative. So they only answer yes or no questions. In particular, lateral flow assays, which will be called LFA in this presentation, are a great opportunity for rapid, low cost and accessible diagnosis. LFAs contain a carrier material with dry reagents activated by the liquid sample. This simple test setup creates the bands. Here we have two examples of lateral flow assays. On the left, there is a test for malleidosis, which is from a colleague, Gabriel Wagner. And a more known example is, for example, the pregnancy test or in our pandemic times, the COVID quick tests. So how do we analyze these essays? With our smartphone reader. And our smartphone reader system consists of a 3D printed photo box for standardized positioning and lighting of the essays. Then of course, a smartphone for image acquisition. 
and our R Shiny app with modular customizable workflow for image editing, analysis, data extraction, calibration, and quantification. On the left, we have this three. 3D printed photo box with the smartphone on top and everything is photographed from above. And on the smartphone, there is this LFA, which is in our case, uh, illuminated with a LED device. And on the right, there is our smartphone with the LF app in the mobile version. And now Philip will continue with the presentation of the application. We develop a new application that includes all tools needed for full LFA image analysis. If the users don't want to perform full image analysis, they can still choose one of the simplified subversions. There are LFA app core, which includes image editing, thresholding, and intensity extraction, LFA app calibration, which includes all the modules from core and calibration, LFA app quantification core plus quantification module and LFA app analysis, which include all modules. On the right side is Shiny LFA Shiny desktop application developed with Shiny package. And on the left side is LFA app mobile analysis developed with Shiny mobile. Now I will show a sample workflow of our application. This is LFA analysis, a version that includes all modules required to perform full LFA image analysis. Each of these modules will be explained further during this demonstration. First, we start by uploading an image. Then we select the area and by double clicking, we zoom in and then we can precisely select the region of interest. It is important the area in between the lines to remain empty because it's used by one of our background correction methods. If we work with images from different flow arrays that contains more than one strip, we can adjust accordingly in the side panel. Now we continue with the background selection. In the background selection tab, first we select the, stri the strip, then we select what kind of image we use. We have also options to convert the image to one of different modes or by choosing one of the channels. Then if we need to invert the colors in the image, we use um, yes in the lines are darker than the background. This is needed when working with some images with fluorescent dyes. And then we select one of four thresholding methods then we can apply the threshold. When we apply threshold, on the main menu, it's shown first the threshold of both lines. Then we can see the signal intensity above background from line one and line two. And below that, uh, we can see the signal after background subtraction. In the bottom, mean and median intensities of both lines are shown. If we are happy with our result, we can include it to intensity data. Then we can load another image and continue with our analysis. When we finish with the background correction of all images, we can switch to intensity data. In the intensity data, we can find a table which includes all metadata as well as values extracted from the images. Then we can save this table or continue to experiment info. In experiment info, we can upload information about experiment, such as concentration or the name of the sample. This table can be merged with our intensity data, and then we can proceed with calibration. In the calibration tab, first thing to do is to set working directory or use the default one. We can also 
upload an existing merge data and run the calibration. In our case, we are working with technical replicates, so we would like to average them. We choose average technical replicates, we choose the column with sample information, the number of analytes, and the column with color information. Then I will select mean as a measure for averaging. When we average the technical replicates, now we would like to reshape from long to white. So I will use the column color and reshape the table. And then I will proceed with calibration. Calibration. <clears throat> we can start the calibration by assigning analysis name and choosing one of, of the three models. Then we should select the column with the concentration. I will use here IL6. We can also logarithmize concentration. And then we can specify the response variable. The response variable is our expression, and then that allows us to use any complex formula. In this case, I will use a rather simple formula. So I will use mean of the first line by using red channel, and I will divide that with the sum of the both lines. And then I will start the calibration. The results tab consists of calibration model summary, a plot with calibration curve, and limit of blank, limit of detection, and limit of quantification are shown below the calibration curve. We can also open an analysis report, which is a markdown file that documents transparently all the operations that happen under the hood. Which can be used later as documentation. When the calibration finishes, the results are saved as well as the model, and then the model can be used in our quantification module. In the quantification tab, we can use intensity data extracted with our application, or we can upload a CSV file with intensity data. Then we can up upload a model, which is RDS file, and run the prediction. The predicted concentration is always added as the last column of this table, which at the end can be downloaded. That was a demonstration of the workflow of our application, and now back to Veronica. Okay, so what does the future hold for us? What is what are our outlooks and what are further projects of ours? Of course, our first priority is to optimize the application and to do further improvements on it based on feedback. For example, we used the application in one of our master's programs and uh, we immediately, immediately had some more bugs which we needed to fix. For example, the first thing we needed to do was to implement an autosave because for many students the application crashed and then they needed to start from the complete beginning and this was one of the first things we needed to arrange. And of course, from the knowledge we got from the band-based uh, essay application, we now started to work on applications for spot detection in these array formats. Example of an array format, in this case, a protein array is here on the slide. Next steps would also include automatic spot or band detection, for example, via machine learning and the use for, of uh, other applications with spots or bands, for example, gel electrophoresis images. And this project and hopefully many more projects were funded by the Bundesministerium für Bildung und Forschung. In the end, we want to tell you a bit about all the packages we used. And of course, if you're interested in more about the topic, here are some resources for you. So of course we needed Shiny and Shiny Mobile for the application, Shiny Js, Shiny Themes, EBI Image for image editing and stuff our markdown to create the report, 
DT, ggplot2, FS, and MGCV. And I thank you very much for your attention. We hope you liked our presentation and we wish you a really good time at the conference. So uh, I will just check the, uh, the uh, question so far. So uh, personally, I have a question. To be honest, I, ha I have never used Shiny Mobile. I, I have been always interested by it, but I have never used it. How was your experience with, with, this, uh, with this package? Was it smooth or? Uh, yeah, actually the package was uh, really smooth and uh, it uses the shiniest uh, base. And actually uh, mo uh, most of the LMS are, are conver converted to F7 widgets. So yeah, there was no problem. Like ev almost everything is converted. There are maybe slight, uh, um, yeah, they, they don't, don't always aesthetically look, look perfect, but uh, in general, uh, yeah, everything was good. The one problem that we noticed was that uh, the touch screen is not uh, registered when we use interactive plot, but uh, it, that can be solved with short JavaScript, JavaScript, JavaScript that converts uh, clicks to, or touch to clicks. Thank you so much. And um, I, I have seen that you are using like very complex shiny apps. That's really awesome to see. Like you're not uh, from computer science or any related field. You're a biologist, if I can say, or medical scientist. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. How did you get there? How did you master this shiny knowledge? I mean, uh, it, it requires a lot of a lot of skills to to, to sketch up all these kind of uh, applications and behaviors and this kind of situation. How did you manage to to learn that? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, please. Okay, so for me, it was um, I did my master thesis at the lab of Professor Matthias Kohl, and he suggested they, that I should check out this. Um, so basically, he's a statistics professor at a university, and he is doing data science and, and R all the time. And he suggested to do this R shiny application as a topic for my master thesis. And from this topic, um, actually, this pack package also arose. So I was more on the side of the spot detection, and this um, what I said in the in the last part of the presentation. And then from this, we we also did in parallel this project with this line detection. Yeah. So yeah, we had a few courses with statistics and and our data science in our master degree, but. Other than that, it was just the inspiration of Professor Cole, basically. <laughs> yeah. And I think for Philip, it was similar. I mean, you had uh, you had yeah. interest on your own, but but basically through your master thesis as well, right? Yeah, my background is uh, a bit different. So Veronica is a biologist, and I am medical doctor. But I did uh, a master thesis in in Germany, the same as Veronica. And uh, my, my, my thesis topic was uh, a bit quite different. So I, I did uh, some deep learning methods for segmentation by using Python. But then after my thesis, I started working with uh, Professor Cole. And yeah, he really loves R. And <laughs> he converted us. And like we are using now R for one year, I could say. Like, yeah, before that, we didn't have much experience, so I, I could say we learned a lot from this application. And now the, the next application that we do, like really we can implement everything that we learned and we can make them like optimized. But Shiny, I'm fascinated how uh, simple it is. Like even for beginners, it's easy to, to understand it and to combine the widgets and things. And even if you want to, to scale it like more and to make it more advanced, yeah, nobody, there is no limitations. Yeah, and also the modularity of it, because you can do very complex things, but you can also do very, very simple things basically with the with the shiny applications. And that's really, really an opportunity also for, for life science field, yeah. Well, nice. In, the, in this context, there is an interesting question uh, from Nono Gue. Uh, he's asking, would you consider your app a production app or is it still a proof of concept? 
um, I would say um, that it's still in better phase because we um, gave it to the students one time a month ago or two months ago. So a lot of students tested it, I would say around a lot of 50, more than 50 students. And there were many bugs and problems in the application. We solved yeah. almost all of them. And right now, like uh, the last feature that we implemented was auto save feature. So right now I, I, I could say that even we can, we can start with, to use it like production because every issue was solved. And now yeah, I don't see a problem to, to start well, using I mean, it's also a work in progress because, for example, our uh, partners in Austria, they use it also, or, or we will continue to work with them to adjust to their needs. But it's still like, okay, can you, can you insert this feature as well? And can you do this as well? And so it's always changing and always updated all the time. So it's really... A, a, a work version all the time, yeah. And yeah. to the question where it is hosted right now, it's right now hosted on GitHub, on Philip's account. Ah, uh, so thank you so much, Veronica and Philip. Uh, we will go now to the uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Jonathan CD. Uh, Jonathan CD is, of course, just to remind everyone, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, answer all the questions because of time schedule, but feel free to ask later in the uh, Slack channel. So um, I will just introduce Jonathan. Uh, I think he's really famous in the R community. He has developed many great packages, uh, especially related to Shiny. And I have used, to be honest, many of his packages, which I, and I was always satisfied. He's, great, he's a great developer. And he will, talk, he will talk about unit testing Shiny application reactivity, which is a really, really interesting talk. I'm interested by that because reactivity is a big uh, beast in Shiny. So uh, testing this kind of behavior would be uh, just perfect to improve like uh, the robustness of Shiny application. So Jonathan, whenever you want to share your screen. Okay, so hello, my name is Yanni Sidi. Uh, I'm a uh, director of modeling and simulation at a pharmaceutical company called Sage Therapeutics based in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. This talk is gonna be about unit testing Shiny app reactivity. And so the motivation for this talk is the ability to diagnose and resolve cascading reactivity in Shiny applications, which is an integral part of a good application development, preventing, preventing the waste of resources and negative user experiences. What is cascading reactivity? It's when elements in a Shiny app trigger each other in a manner that the developer did not intend. So unit testing is something that a lot of package developers are used to, uh, either through test that or tiny test. And it's uh, a way to create short expectations that can test different parts of a package. And using this type of framework, this package reactor is creating the same type of outline and framework in order to diagnose and resolve reactivity problems in Shiny. The added benefit of having this type of unit testing is that it creates a defensive, develop, defensive development that can be applied to Shiny applications for both to plan, to plan and preserve reactivity with multiple developers working on the applications. So, in many of my uh, open source activities and also in at uh, production level, uh, many people are uh, creating at the same time as uh, the same Shiny app. And when you commit code to a repository, it could be that you are breaking part of the app and, and breaking it in the reactivity state and reactivity level and not necessarily the objects that it creates. So this, this package comes to answer this problem. There are different types of packages out in the in the R in CRAN. Um, most of them are actually testing that after reactivity has occurred, and that they're testing that output is as expected, be it uh, 
a UI object, such as a graph, a plot, or some kind of different UI element, and not necessarily that it's being triggered correctly, uh, that it's not calling the same UI over and over again, which has second order effects in the app and can slow it down a lot. So now I'll go through the API and of the, of the package. And what it is, is you, so you load the reactor and then you initialize a reactor, which is basically an R6 object. And you can see it is expecting to be populated by two objects, the application that you're using and the driver, which has specifications for either an R Selenium or uh, a puppeteer. The application can be either using run, up, run app arg arguments, so you have a path to the app directory, or you can use the Golem package after you build your, your Shiny as a package, and then you use set Golem args in order to define the place of where your app is located. What's going on under the hood is that Reactor is setting a test port, a test path, an IP, and the directory. And this is all the information needed in order to run your app in a process X in the, in the background. So you can have your current session running, and while that's running, your Shiny app is running in a different session. The driver is chosen next, and you can use either a Chrome driver or a Firefox driver currently. And all you have to do is take your object that you initialize and pipe that into a set Chrome driver or a Firefox. Then you can then you can control headless mode. So with this, you can you can run the app either headless or not headless, which is one of the options that you can use in uh, with the package. Starting reactor, so once we have specifications in place, both for the app and for the driver, they're both running in background processes, and then we can manipulate the Shiny app as it runs. So right now, the way that it's set up, our Selenium can be, can be used. In the same way, the reactor also works with Cry, uh, which is uh, open source that, uh, uh, was created, which works much the same way our Selenium does. And you can see how it works on the GitHub repository. Interacting with the application. So the reactor comes with pre-built common actions that lowers a threshold for working with the application. So you can either in inject commands into the app. So you can set ID values or execute JavaScript calls, or you can query different elements inside the app at the same time while it's running. So you can query the input names or the output names, either all of them or specific one by the ID. And then you can also query anything in the app using JavaScript, uh, raw, Java, raw JavaScript that you can call. Closing the reactor is simple, just kill the app, which kills both the child processes that are running in the background that reactor is using. Constructing the pipelines in order to work with the apps while they're running. So this is an example of a, of a full pipeline. So you're initializing the reactor, you're setting the, the application, you're adding the Chrome driver, you're starting the reactor, and then in this case, it's manipulating the input N, and then it's closing the app. This same pipeline can be used in order to test expectations on the app while it's running. So here I added two lines where after setting the initial, after setting the ID value n to, to a new value, I, ex I test the expectation that there was one hit to the reactivity of the, of the uh, output hist. I change the value again and I test the reactivity that happened the second time. So there's, a count there's an internal counter that is checking how often an input is being hit or changed. Another way to, to test expectations is to test for how long is Shiny busy for a single interaction event or, or the cumulative time that it was busy throughout the app while it was running. 
So again, after setting the after starting the reactor and changing the input value, I can expect that the time the Chinese was was busy was 0 0.1 seconds. And then after I test the time, I can write along the same pipeline, test the test that it was that hist was hit one time. All of this can then be added into a test that integration. So I can put that same exact pipeline into test that and add and create a test that uh, flow in order to test my Shiny app now. So here I'm adding the describe and it uh, framework for test that reactive hits to, in a plot for reactive chunk. And I'm testing that if that if hist was hit twice. The way that reactor understands that and helps test that understand that there's two different types of tests because maybe you have a package and you have a shiny app that you have in the same directory, you such as a golem application, you can reactor has a prefix reactor instead of test. And that way test that you won't by accident trigger the reactivity tests as you're running your regular unit tests for the app. This creates an isolated reactivity area in order to uh, test your activity and it will not interact with cover because that's expecting a test prefix too. So here's an example of running test app. And here, you, and it's running against two different types of apps. One is expected to fail and one is accepted to pass. So here you can see that it's the same exact output you would get through test that and running. And so you know what to expect when you're running it. And here, one failed and one passed. And finally, uh, there's, continue, there's continuous integration. So you can run this whole uh, workflow through, for example, here, this is GitHub Actions. So as you commit, you can uh, have GitHub, uh, GitHub Actions test your activity for every commit or pull request that you, that you have. So the idea being that what if I commit something to a repository I'm working with 10 other people on, it is guarded against anything that I do that would break the reactivity that is already in the system. And in that way, we can have a uh, better collaboration across multiple users. So as a conclusion, Reactor simplifies diagnosing reactivity issues in Shiny. It creates a framework to store and reproduce testing of Shiny apps can be applied to continuous integration, and it creates a, sh a safer Shiny app development practices for teams to collaborate. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really, it's really an impressive product, to be honest. I uh, We did a lot with the activity and reactivity cascading, and like when the app grows, uh, I must admit that it became insanely hard to, to, to manage and to maintain, to be honest. Um, I have uh, the first question that uh, came in my mind. It's a, uh, it's a bit of a silly question, but for, uh, for example, the function that you use, uh, expect time busy, and you have provided like a fixed unit. Is it like an estimation of the time or because we, we can't be certain of the exact amount of time? How does it work exactly? Yeah, so it's so you have to give up front for the expectation. You have to give up front what is the expected time that you're that you that you have for a certain uh, reactivity to, to take place. So you have to give that to the expectation, just like any other expectation and test that. You have to know the answer to test against it, right? Cool, but my question is that uh, this kind of estimation or uh, time, um, the time process may depend on um, several other factors. For example, the internet bandwidth, I don't know, the uh, computer uh, RAM, et cetera. So how we can manage that from one user to another? 
Yeah, so uh, if, if it is used in the continuous integration framework, then you do have a consistent machine working on the cloud. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're testing yeah. the same machine over and over again. Ah, uh, perfect, thank you so much. So there is another question here in the chat. So is it possible from Thomas Capretto? Uh, he said, is it possible to test input outputs inside the modules? Yes, so it's uh, you, you can query any input or output, uh, uh, the names of them during the Shiny Up run. So even if it's in a, in a module, it still has an address for that Shiny uses in order to, to have the Shiny Up run properly. So you, you will be able to, 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 be, to use the, the, right the right input name inside the modules. Thank you. Uh, and there is another question from Jonas Hagenberg. Uh, can you also set the values of reactive val and reactive values? Can you say, yeah. So you can using set uh, the, the, the injecting, uh, there's a set value by ID. So you can give the ID of, a, of an object inside the app and you can set the, the value of that. So it can be, uh, a number or a text or and then whatever the type that the that the element is expecting you can add it you can you can update it so you can update even uh, uh, um, uh, slide bar or anything that that there is in China you can update through through JavaScript you just need to uh, so the set ID helps you gives you a, a simpler way of doing it but if you need something more elaborate you can uh, inject the, the, the JavaScript directly. Cool. So there is another question from uh, Samuel uh, Calderon. What would be the minimum upscale recommended for starting using this kind of test? I use it for even small ones. So uh, um, it's, it's much like a package. You, mm -hmm. you start doing uh, unit test even from the small because once it gets big even for in a package settings it gets too big and then you're basically ov overwhelmed by how many unit tests you have to do so i would yeah. i would recommend even starting with small and then building out as you add more features to your app you're you're guarding against different uh different uh, uh scenarios that this that the app may have Thank you. Uh, is the package stable? I mean, uh, can we use it in uh, production environment or uh, is it in uh, a development process? So will uh, it be on CRAN? It will be on CRAN. Currently it's on GitHub. Um, the, the main thing that I've run into, I've, I, I use Firefox more often than Chrome. Um, uh, in uh, with Chrome and R Selenium, there 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 is uh, a lot of times uh, synchronization problems with the version of Chrome that that uh, R Selenium uses. So I would personally, I would recommend using a Gecko driver uh, in order to to use the package. But it will be on CRAN. Uh, it's it's pretty close to being uh, uh, production ready. The API is is stable and, and it's just a matter of me finding time in order to, to submit it to Kren. <laughs> uh, to understand. Uh, the last question, if I might, what are the uh, next uh, steps? Uh, are there any new features that you are planning or in the future? Um, I'm, I'm, right now I'm, I'm more using it uh, in my, in my uh, own in my own packages and then seeing that it's uh, being able to interact with uh, uh, Colin's uh, cry uh, uh, package that has a similar uh, features. Um, so having it be able to interact with a lot of different types of packages in the ecosystem. Um, but uh, for right now, it's, it's pretty stable and, and uh, it's just a matter of getting more users to to bang it around in order to see that there's no blind spots. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait to use I can't wait to use the, the package in, in in production environment and uh, see its uh, its magic operate. So, thank you again. Yeah, we will now introduce our next speaker, who is Leon Binder.
Uh, he will present us um, his package, Shiny Quick Starter, which allow us to create Shiny application UI and um, server integration through click and drop, which is pretty impressive. Uh, to be honest, I have tested it uh, just yesterday. Uh, it is working. I, I don't know how, how, it is, how is it possible, but it works. And it is really uh, like impressive. So now let's give, uh, let's go with Shiny Quick Starter. Hello and welcome. My name is Leon Binder. I am from the TC Grafenauer, part of the Deckendorf Institute of Technology in Bavaria, Germany. And today I can proudly present to you the Shiny Quick Starter, which is an our studio add-in for building Shiny apps per drag and drop. This add-in tries to integrate a few different parts. For one, it automizes the folder setup. Then you can create the UI of your Shiny app with drag and drop. The add-in itself also shows you some documentation to the elements that you used and you can adapt the elements that you use, um, for example, uh, changing the input IDs, the labels or other options that those UI elements have. And in the end, you can export your code and immediately start with like implementing your actual program logic. I've put the focus of this add-in on two main parts. That's the usability during the entire app development process. So you can use it for some initial prototyping, just playing around with the UI elements, then the initial setup of a shiny app at day one, and every time you want to extend it later on. The second main focus is on the user experience of this add-in. I've tried to design it in a way so it's beginner friendly, so new developers who never actually created a shiny app but know a little bit about it can use it, but also it should have like sufficient functionality that advanced developers that have created multiple shiny apps can get something out of it. So what code can be generated? Looking at the global file, what I can do is generate some library imports um, based on like what UI elements that you used. And I can add some very basic code snippets like sourcing all functions or all modules uh, in their respective folders. What I cannot really automize is loading data or pre-processing data because that's very different um, from project to project. Looking at the UI definition, I can pretty much generate the whole UI. Um, the only exceptions are if you want to use some uh, UI elements that are not included in the Shiny Quick Starter right now, or if you want to add some custom HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. Then the server file, I cannot actually uh, generate the program logic but I can generate the basic layout of the server file. So if you, for example, use a Plotly output, then I know that you also need a render Plotly function on the same ID. And then um, if you want to create a module, it's pretty much the same. The UI module function can be generated fully or almost fully. And for the server uh, module function, I can generate the very basic layout. So let's jump right in into a little demonstration. Um, you can install the package currently only from CRAN with like the install package um, command and then launch the add-in through the Shiny Quick Starter function or through our studio itself um, with like clicking on the add-ins drop down menu and then build Shiny apps per track and drop. So when you launch the Shiny Quick Starter, it's going to open in your default browser and already show you a little help tour. I would really recommend going through it at least once when you use the add-in for the first time because it, it leads you through the add-in and pretty much tells you everything that you need to know to use it. And then the next time you can just click anywhere else and it's going to close. So the first decision to make is to decide what page type you want to use. So you have the choices between a few Planko pages like a fluid or fixed page, and then a navbar dashboard or mini page, 
those have a top level navigation built in. Or if you want to extend an existing app, you can set a tag list and it's going to create a shiny module for you. So let's say we want to create an Akbar page. Uh, clicking on it um, then shows in this navigation hierarchy in the top left corner that there's a Nafpa page and within a top panel. I can click on Nafpa page and then it shows me, uh, it highlights it in this drop area and on the right side, it shows me options that I could set. So this Nafpa page, it has a title. So let's say I call it user 2021. Uh, and it immediately updates this title in the navigation bar. And then I can say, okay, I want to use a dog background and I make it, I want to make it collapsible. The snuff bar page would also have a few more arguments. Um, those are like listed down here under all the arguments that you can actually change. And those, if you want to like maybe change uh, the theme, then you have to do that yourself. It's like not included in the shiny quick start to right now. Then I can click on top panel. It's going to highlight the top panel in the drop area and show me the options to this specific top panel. So let's say I want to delete the title uh, and say that it should have the home button, the home icon as button up here. Um, so let's say I want to add a layout element. Layout elements, they just make the design a little bit more different. So for example, I want to use a sidebar layout. So I click on it and go to my drop area. Um, and then where I want to put it, uh, it gets highlighted in yellow and I can drop it and so like release the the left uh, mouse button and then it actually inserts it. This sidebar layout, it also needs a sidebar panel and a main panel inside. So those are added automatically. So I could now change if I want to have the sidebar panel on the right or the left side. And for those panels, they only have like a this uh, option that I could adjust. So going to inputs, um, there are a lot of inputs, um, mostly because shiny widgets has a lot of them. Uh, so here the search can come in handy. So let's say I want to use a select input. So I put it maybe in the sidebar panel and then it shows me the options for this sidebar, uh, the select input. So the first thing is that I need to change the input ID. It right now gave it a random input ID. So maybe I say that it um, says some aggregation level that's saved in this uh, form element. And then I can also change the label. Um, I could also say already some choices that I um, know beforehand, like I want to aggregate data by days, weeks, uh, months, or years. So those choices are going to be added. And I want to have 100% width of this element. Um, so it's like 100% of the width of the parent, the sidebar panel. So next up, I might want to add an output. Uh, outputs um, I might want to like add a plotly output. So I drag and drop that into the main panel. Outputs also, they, they have like an ID. Currently it's randomly set. So I just call it very uncreatively plot um, for this example. And then adjust also the height of it because it's a little bit too high. Um, Outputs are a little bit special because they don't, uh, they have UI, an UI element. So the plotly output and those have like arguments, but they also have a, a function in the server. So in this case, render plotly. 
So plotly output for it, I can change to, I can like a select an expression. So if I already know, okay, I want to aggregate some data that I have loaded based on some time frame. Um, and then I want to show a basic bar plot. So I select that and it's going to add this code with some example data. Um, if I'm finished with the app, I can also go into display mode. It then shows me how the app looks and it's a little bit more realistic. There are not those um, element box around it. If I want to look at the code, I go to the top code UI and then it shows me the code that's going to be generated for the UI definition. I can also go to server and it shows me the code that's generated for the server. And if I would create a module, then it would only show me this module top. If I want to export my code, I well, go to the export top and there are two uh, sub tops. So the first one is folders. So here I can uh, select some directory where I want to put my new app and say, um, maybe I want to create a subfolder, so I just call it user 2021. Um, I also want to maybe create a new or studio project with the same name. And I want to create folders for my data, my functions, modules, and for some other web assets. So I click on export folders. It shows me what folders and files are going to be created and gives me a warning that existing files are going to be overwritten. So I confirm it and now this folder structure is set up. I can go to the export code top and um, here I select this uh, folder that I just created. And then I can decide what do I want to put my global UI and server code in one file or multiple files and um, what code snippets do I want to have in my global files. So like sourcing all functions and modules and maybe clearing all objects from the workspace before I start the app. So I can also click on export code. It shows me what files are going to be um, generated and then I can say export code. And now it's uh, fully set up my app. So I can switch over to our studio and here it shows me my newly created folder use R 2021. In it, I have those folders. I have uh, our project file and I have my global, my UI and my server file. So the UI file, it added those very basic code snippets and said what libraries I need for this app to run successfully. Then your UI here could now add some HTML, CSS or JavaScript or like adjust it like I need it. And the server file with this one render plotly function. So I can click on run app and it's going to start it in a browser. And here is my app my very, very simplistic app that I just created. Obviously there's no prog uh, program logic behind it. Um, so now I would have to make some connections. So if this input aggregation is days, then I aggregate by days and re-render this plotly output. So obviously this add-in can be further developed. Um, besides some code optimizations and bug fixes here and there, I hope that I can also extend the uh, add-in by the Shiny Dashboard Plus package because it would be a really nice extension of like the general Shiny Dashboard package. Then it would also be nice to have an export input functionality, not of the code itself, but like the current state of your created app in the Shiny Quick Starter. Um, so like what elements have you used and what arguments, uh, values have you set? Then the third point would be to allow movement of UI elements, because currently if you want to move an element, you need to remove it and then add a new one and make those adjustments again, because, uh, and that can be a little bit tedious. 
Um, another point with a lower priority is like enabling connections between inputs and outputs in the add-in itself. So like saying uh, some data table should only re-render if I click on a button because there's a time-consuming calculation behind it, for example. And the last point to add arguments and a return statement for modules. So if you have further ideas or like um, notes uh, for me, you can clearly contact me. Otherwise, uh, thank you for listening. And I hope that uh, the Shiny Quick Start uh, will help you from time to time. Well, thank you so much, Leon. It's really impressive uh, how fast and how easy can one um, build like a Shiny app or the structure of Shiny app. So it's really, really impressive. Uh, there are uh, many questions. So the first one from the Slack channel. Uh, so Leon, it seems that the quick shiny UI cannot auto save. Is there any chance it can save the work in progress? Currently, it unfortunately cannot, but I'm um, hoping that I can include that. It should be pretty easy um, just saving two data tables. So that's definitely a feature that I want to include. Thanks. So uh, there is another question. Uh, uh, is it possible to open and modify an already existing app? Uh, that's not possible and probably also will not be possible in the future because it gets really complicated if your existing app has some UI elements which I don't support in the Shiny Quick Starter. It would then maybe delete it or I don't know how it would handle it. So it's it's really just for the initial setup and then every time you want to extend your app with a new module, you can do that and um, existing apps modifying that you have to do in our studio itself. Uh, there is another question from Riyad. Uh, he said, wow, magic. Uh, is, there, is there certain apps where you recommend or you don't recommend using this add-in? Um, well, I, I wouldn't really recommend building a huge complex app with it because it could be that it's crashing at some point. Um, but if you, if you start with a simple app, like a dashboard page, for example, with a few menu points, uh, and then you extend it afterwards with like new modules, that's working pretty well. So. And also for like simplest, uh, simplistic apps, it's it's working fine. That's really great. So there is another question from Nano Gui. Uh, he's asking, I'm sorry, great job, Leon. Very impressive work. Are you planning to add the ability for the app to create modules from the add-in in, in, uh, in the initial setup? Um, in the initial setup, not. Um, it's It's really better to um, divide those two parts. So you first set up your shiny app, a simple one uh, with a basic layout, and then further on you make modules because mostly you you will uh, not really know what modules and um, parts you want to have at like the initial setup, but more like later on when you are expanding your existing app. Cool. So. Uh... I have, I have a question personally. So um, is there any work in progress to, for example, add some like external files to the Shiny app interactively? So from the UI, like for example, add an image here, put it like for, for uh, add, I don't know, uh, some CSS and see the result immediately on the screen. Is there any, uh, I mean, in the future or something? Um, I have that on a list, a very long list of future features that I might want to include. Um, but it has a lower priority right now. It has lower priority. Yes. Great. Um, let me see if there is another question because we have we still have one minute. Um, so I will ask like a, a quick question. So you have used like shiny the shiny widgets package. Right? Yes. Yeah. So it, I assume it is it, it is possible to integrate other packages. Yes. So in the back end, um, I, I thought about how to develop this package for a few weeks. Um, so I decided to have one big Excel list 
where I add all the UI elements that I want to include uh, or include right now, and then um, have different aspects uh, that I categorize them. So for example, um, a box you can only use in a dashboard page, but you can put other elements into a box, but then an action button you can use everywhere, but you cannot put something into an action button. And also for those arguments, I listed them and then said what of them are required and default values. So um, when I added those widgets uh, from the shiny widgets package, uh, I could add just 70% of those UI elements just by adding it to this Excel list and then restarting the app and see if it break uh, it broke something, but like in 70%, it worked really well. But then every once in a while, there's a UI element, which is kind of different from the other ones. And then um, it means I need to adjust some code here and there. Well, uh, it really, look, uh, it really looks impressive. And uh, uh, thank you so much for your work and for your contribution. I hope it will grow and we will like be able to build Shiny apps, very complex, using just a click and the mouse. Yes. So thank you so much for making this abstraction, especially for newcomers. Um, so I will just introduce uh, now the next speaker. So uh, the next speaker is Tobia De Konik. Uh, he works at Open Analytics, and he will talk. He will talk about the good news about Shiny Proxy. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Tobia De Konik. I work for Open Analytics, and I'm going to present the Shiny Proxy Good News Show. So let me first introduce Open Analytics. We are a data science consultancy company um, based in Belgium. We have a strong track record in R, and one of the things we do is developing open source projects for using R in enterprise context. This talk is about Shiny Proxy, which is a web application to deploy Shiny apps in an enterprise context. Every app is a self-contained Docker image, and this flexibility allows you to host Shiny apps, Dash apps, Jupyter notebooks, R Studio, Streamlit, Zeppelin notebooks, um, yeah, you name it. These apps run on Docker, or Docker Swarm, or Kubernetes, and therefore Shiny Proxy is a very scalable solution. We support several authentication uh, options, and that ensures that you get, can run Shiny Proxy in your existing infrastructure. So here you see a screenshot of Shiny Proxy. Um, yeah, basically when you open Shiny Proxy, you get a list of applications, and you can launch an application, as you can see in this screenshot, screenshot where I launched a Shiny application. Okay, so in this talk, I want to demonstrate the highlights of our latest release and some upcoming exciting features. Um, so the first thing I want to discuss is a Shiny proxy operator for Kubernetes. And basically the idea of the operator is um, to ensure your cluster doesn't look like this, yeah, doesn't end like this ship. Okay, so maybe first uh, explain what the Kubernetes is. So Kubernetes uh, defines itself as an open source system for automating deployment, scaling and management of containerized applications. So yeah, it's indeed an ideal platform for running Shiny Proxy. Okay, what's a Kubernetes operator then? Well, we define it as a small piece of software that extends the Kubernetes API in order to fully automate operation of a complex application. So basically the operator uh, will manage the lifecycle of Shiny Proxy servers. And um, yeah, the, the reason we need it basically is to ensure that you can update the configuration of Shiny Proxy without affecting the session of the user. So when an administrator updates the configuration of a of Shiny Proxy, the operator creates a new Shiny Proxy server, but it keeps the existing server as long as users are using it. So those users which are running an app will stay on all server and can keep using their application. Um, okay, that's nice, but what if existing users want to start using an app from the new Shiny Proxy server? Well, um, they get a notification in, on the main page and they can decide themselves that they want to switch to the new server and use a new application. Another reason why we need operator is to allow seamless updates of the Shiny Proxy server itself. Um, so to yeah, basically update the version of Shiny Proxy. Yeah, the operator also allows you to do multi-tenant hosting of Shiny Proxy. Um, yeah, you can, yeah, this allows you to run multiple Shiny Proxy servers along each other. Each server has their own configuration and is fully isolated. 
Um, and finally, another reason is that you can allow app developers to easily add or update apps. So app developers, not system administrators, they can really easily update the Shiny proxy configuration because they only have to change the YAML file. The operator will take care of launching the new server. And the very nice thing is that um, errors in the configuration will not cause downtime because the operator will never root users to an unreachable instance. Okay, that sounds nice, but how does it work? Well, we have three components. First of all, we have the Shiny Proxy Operator, which is a, yeah, basically a Kotlin application uh, packaged into a Docker container. Then we have Skipper, which is an ingress controller for Kubernetes. Uh, and this, yeah, this Skipper handles the routing of users to the correct Shiny Proxy server. And finally, we need Redis uh, for the session persistence, so that the user stays logged in when they are transferred to a new server. Okay, now let's, let's look at the demo. Okay, for the demo of the operator, I'm first going to show you the, um, the tool I use to visualize the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so as you can see, we have basically three components. We have the skipper ingress component, the race component, and the operator itself. Here you can also see the logs of the operator. Um, yeah. So, okay, to start, I'm going to deploy a shiny proxy server. And to do that, we need a YAML file with the uh, specification of the Shiny Proxy server. So this YAML file is very similar to the usual application.yaml file uh, of Shiny Proxy. It only contains some extra metadata for the Kubernetes API. Okay, so I create, I have the file ready. I'm now going to create it in the Kubernetes cluster. So I just with the kubectl command line tool. Um, so I created it and now you can see the operator is working and it's creating a new Shiny Proxy server. So now we have to wait until that server is ready. Okay, we see that the Shiny Proxy server is ready. You can now access it um, using our browser. I'm going to log in as Jack and launch an application. Okay, the application is launched. I'm going to add an ingredient. So let's say an apple. Voila. Um, and now I'm going to add a new application to the Shiny Proxy configuration. So again, I'm going to my Shiny Proxy file and I'm going to add Power Studio. Voila, I added the specification. Now I'm going to update the uh, resource inside Kubernetes. So we will now see in the UI that the operator is creating a new Shiny Proxy server, but we will also see that the existing application is still working and we can, for example, add a new ingredient to prove that. So we'll add a banana and you will see that it recomputes the nutrition. Voila. Um, so the app is still working. Now, you just have to wait um, until the new server is ready. Okay, Shiny Proxy server is ready and we can see that this old server is still ready. We can go back to the application, add a new ingredient. And indeed, it still works, it recomputes the nutrition. Okay, let's say we are now an other user and I'm going to log in in a private tab as uh, Jeff. And indeed, we see that RStudio is in the list of applications. So I can launch the application. Voila, the application is launched and we can use RStudio. Now, you can have a look at the main page of the check user. And we will see that our studio isn't in the list of applications. That is because the user is still having an application on the old server. So um, they are using the old server and they don't see our studio. The user can choose to switch to the new version by clicking this button and accepting the warning that they still have one application running. And now they are transferred to the new server and indeed our studio is in the list of applications. So we can again launch the application. And now 
the application launch, and if you now go to the UI of um, uh, the UI for Kubernetes, you will see soon that the old server is cleaned up. Well, the old server will be cleaned up as soon as the application um, is gone, so we will need to wait for the timeout. Okay, you see that the shiny proxy, the old shiny proxy server is being removed um, because it's no longer running any applications. So now we are only left with one shiny proxy server running our studio. Now we can talk a bit more about shiny proxy as a first class Kubernetes citizen. Um, this is something which was released in some in the latest versions. We introduced two new configuration option, options, the Kubernetes pod patches and the Kubernetes additional manifest option. And these options basically allow you to modify the pods created by Shiny Proxy. And with this option, you can create persistent workspaces for users, which is very useful in our studio or Jupyter notebooks. It, yeah, it allows you to um, set a custom service account for each user or each app. It allows you to set up a custom namespace and so on. The possibilities are endless, you only have to use your creativity. We also introduced the readiness and liveness probes. Um, yeah, th these are the, like, the mechanism to yeah, indicate to Kubernetes when Shiny Proxy is ready to accept traffic. And this is important for the operator um, in order to prevent downtime when the operator updates Shiny Proxy. Okay. Uh, another thing we introduced in the latest versions is um, yeah, better observability of Shiny Proxy. So we can export um, Prometheus metrics and we also added more metadata to the application, like the containers which are created by Shiny Proxy. And these features allow you to create very nice dashboards, for example in Grafana, where you can yeah, plot the startup time, the usage time, the amount of users, and so on. Okay, now let's have a look at features that we are going to introduce yeah, soon in a future release. Um, one of these features is to run multiple instances of an app. So for running multiple instances of an application, the workflow is very similar. First of all, we start an application, like the RStudio application. We wait until it's ready. And then we can use this server, uh, this RStudio server, for example, to do some very advanced computations. Then we can click the switch instance button. And you see here we have the default instance. We have a button to stop the app and to restart the app. First of all, we are going to start a new um, instance, give it a name test, and we click the submit button. So now a new instance is launched, and we will see that indeed we have a new R session and we don't have the computations we did earlier. Um, and again, we can do some computations. Um, I can launch a uh, third instance. And as you can see, my like, sysadmin can configure a maximum amount of instances. In this case, the maximum amount is five instances, and I'm running two instances. Okay, so you can see we have the stop app and restart buttons. Um, I will press the restart button of this app. Yeah, we get a confirmation. You can click OK, and the app restarts. This is useful if you want to start with a fresh arc session. For example, if you yeah, did something wrong and you want to restart. Then we can also press the stop app button and this will simply stop the app. Voila, the app is stopped, it's cleaned up, um, everything is gone and um, we can restart the app again. We can also stop apps that are not re currently running in the current tab, for example the app we started early on. And this is useful um, to clean up yeah, any apps you forgot about or yeah, basically that. Another feature we introduced is a reconnecting WebSocket feature. This mechanism allows uh, automatically reconnects when the WebSocket connection of an application is disconnected. For example, when the Wi-Fi connection of a user is unstable, this mechanism will uh, kick in and automatically reconnect your connection. The last feature I want to show you is the app recovery feature. 
uh, when enabled, this will restore any running application when you restore Shiny Proxy. Okay, you are at the end of my talk. Yeah, I tried to cover some of the exciting news around Shiny Proxy. Uh, if you want to know all the details, please have a look at our website, where we also uh, will announce a new release with all new features, and of course provide some extensive documentation. Uh, thank you for your thank you for coming to the talk and have a nice conference. Thank you so much, Tobias. So it was really interesting. Uh, to be honest, we we was shiny proxy in, uh, in where, where I'm working right now, and it's really uh, effective. And it's now somehow it is easy to to update the shiny app and put it into production just with a few commands. So uh, really, really uh, a great product. So uh, I will jump to the uh, questions right now. There is a question which I think you have already answered, but uh, it would be great if. Uh, the, uh, the audience uh, can hear the answer. So uh, the question states, um, Tobia, how does the operator handle scaling applications pods? Does it support horizontal pod autoscaler resources for application? How does it load balancing across multiple application pods? Okay, um, so currently the operator um, doesn't support scaling. We have some plans for it and making Shiny Proxy Hile available and that yeah, will allow to scale Shiny Proxy. Um, so currently it isn't there yet. Um, and yeah, with respect to load balancing, we currently use Skipper for routing the HTTP traffic. So once we introduce scaling, um, that will also be used for load balancing. Thank you. So uh, I will check if there is another question. Uh, I think we don't have another one, but I will ask just, I'm, I'm not really an expert into uh, app de deployment, to be honest, but uh, I, I think um, Shiny Proxy work with uh, Docker containers, right? So could you please, in few words, explain how these two, I mean, uh, distinct products interact mm -hmm. with Shiny Proxy? Yes, so the idea of having the apps in, in your Docker container is that like every app or every instance of your app is isolated from any other app um, so that you can use a different R version for two apps um, or a different version of Shiny um, or, or even run um, apps that are not Shiny apps like Python apps or um, Dash apps and so on. And also like the, the second thing is that we can uh, because uh, they are all like small containers running an app, we can really scale um, the servers on which the apps are running. So you are not limited with one server running Shiny Proxy and all apps or all um, R code, but you can have a cluster of multiple servers um, running yeah, multiple instances of an app and, and scaling yeah, upscaling um, the service when needed. Uh, for example, we have customers that maybe they use a few apps, but sometimes they have to give a training or a demo. And then at one point, uh, like 30 or 50 users start using, um, uh, every user starts using an application. And then the, the backend servers, like the, not the servers, but the, the physical servers are scaling up and there is more resources to run the app. Um, and that's also one feature that we, we can provide because you are using Docker. Thank you. Um, I will just check if there is another question from the chat. Um, for now, I think uh, not, but I, I will ask another, I, I have another question. So what are, if you can just cite a, a few advantages or disadvantages? Could you make a comparison between uh, Shiny Proxy and, for example, another uh, deployment product, for example, uh, RStudio Connect or uh, what, what are the advantages of using Shiny Proxy over RStudio Connect, for example? Mm. Yeah, I can, I can uh, tell a bit about it, but I'm not an expert in the other products. Um, but yeah, I think one example is that like um, with Shiny Proxy, every feature is open source and uh, freely available, so you can use any feature without limitation. For example, I think we, we have like support for different authentication backends like SAML and LDAP and, and so on. Um, 
that allows you to integrate with your existing infrastructure and uh, your existing application. And I think that's one limitation of the other products. Um, and also, yeah, we, we allow running different kinds of apps. So uh, typically, yeah, typically we see people using Shiny apps, but also our studio itself um, and um, like Python apps. And yeah, in the, the version we are currently working on will allow you to run multiple instances of an app so that you can, yeah, one great thing is to run multiple instances of our studio. Um, which I think is also a limitation of the other project, or only in the yeah, paid version, I guess. Um, so there are some yeah, differences. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tobia. Uh, maybe the, the last question. Uh, I have seen uh, in uh, the, uh, your abstract that uh, you, uh, the Shiny Proxy can deploy uh, H2O Wave uh, new application. I think it's only available for now in Python. Mm -hmm. So when it will be available on R, so Shiny Proxy will be able to to serve this kind of application. Um, so like Shiny Proxy is not limited to R applications. It yeah. Can, if you can package it into an R, uh, into a Docker container and run it as a web server, you can run it in Shiny Proxy. Uh, so cool. you can also run Python applications without having them to like be limited to R or something. Ah, uh, yeah, so uh, we just need uh, like a Docker container and then we can use, for example, Django, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. Flask, any uh, web uh, web app deployment, uh, anything. Yes, any it is possible. Uh, so that's great, that's great. I, uh, I didn't know that, to be honest. Um, so I think uh, if there is any other question, I think people can ask you and meet you in the, in the Slack. Mm -hmm. So I think I will... Um, uh, just ask my co-host and host if there is uh, another time for Q&A or we, should we just uh, wrap up the session? We can wrap up. Uh, we can wrap up. Awesome. So thank you, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us. Uh, I, I would like to, to thank um, uh, everyone, every person involved in uh, organizing this event. Um, so there, there are too many to, to sides. Uh, and it's like, I would say that it's like uh, a tremendous work. and being able to see it like in action and live streaming like that uh, is really great. So thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for uh, all the uh, people who are here. Thank you so much.